What's up everybody? This is the 2023 Volvo S60 Recharge. So for this S60 Recharge rebranding, it used to be called the T8 and it still has a T8 badge on the back, but this is the plug-in hybrid version of the S60 and uh, it got a huge improvement. So on the outside here, nothing's changed. They haven't changed the styling here in the past several years. This whole generation has stayed the same, but that also shows just how good this design was when it first came out. I still think it looks fantastic. For 2023 here, you have this black edition that's available and gives you the black grille, black wheels, and the black back. Badging. Uh, but aside from that, yeah, everything else has stayed the same and the interior is basically the same as well. The big change though is under the skin. So uh, it got rid of the supercharger it used to have. It's now turbocharged only uh, and it has over double the range of the previous T8 version and a lot more power as well. And so it's really a fun hot rod and we'll see that as we go out onto a back road here in a minute. But yeah, so the interior hasn't changed here in the S60 really aside from getting a slight tweak to the infotainment system, which I'll get to in a second. But if you want to hear a full deep dive on the interior of the S60. I will link at the end of this video my previous review of an S60 where I go into all the details of this interior. And overall, it's really nice. It's really impressive with the materials, the comfort, uh, but it does have some big downfalls as well. And uh, having lived with this vehicle for a, a week here again, um, you know, some of those things are a little annoying. One of the main things is there's not very many places to put things since the plug-in hybrid version has the battery here right down the center tunnel. You have shallow cup holders and a tiny little space, which is unfortunately Unfortunately, because you have to plug your phone in because you don't have wireless Apple CarPlay and wireless Android Auto. If you want that smartphone integration, you got to plug it in here and really sandwich your phone in here with the cable and try and close this, which is tough. And if you have a large phone, it might not even fit at all. So not great as far as the interior space here. That is one of the big problems. Um, another thing that I don't love is this infotainment system in general. Now it has Google built in now. And so maybe if you have an Android phone, it might be a little more integrated and nice. But with my iPhone here, it's not very well integrated. And uh, uh, it just is kind of unfortunate the way they set everything up so that, you know, even like Bluetooth audio streaming, it's like showing me folders and it's just really cluttered. I just end up going onto my phone and hitting play and then it'll work properly. It's kind of an old school thing with the way I'm using Bluetooth audio streaming here in this. It's kind of terrible, honestly. And uh, Sirius XM also isn't super user friendly whenever you're going through there. Uh, but I mean, the Google Maps part is nice. Uh, and, you know, but there's very little functionality with this uh, screen otherwise. And another thing is they buried the drive modes. There's no drive mode selector anymore like there used to be in the Volvos here. And instead you got to go into the settings and then go into the car settings and then your drive modes come up. It's nice you still have them, but it seems like they're kind of discouraging people from using those. So don't love that either. But I did drive about 250 miles on the highway in this vehicle and a couple of things that are fantastic as far as the interior goes is first off the comfort of these seats. It's almost shocking just how comfortable they are. They are so, so nice and I love the design of them too with uh, this textile on the sides and the leather in the middle. Um, and uh, the only downfall though that I'm seeing with these seats is that on the configurator, there's no way to get ventilated seats in an S60 anymore. And there's also uh, no way to get the massage function. You used to be able to get in the T8s, you get ventilated seats with massage and it was great. You can get it in a nice brown leather color and stuff. You can't get any of that anymore. I'm not sure why, but you know, for a vehicle, this one's, you know, over $60,000 to not have cooled seats is really a bummer, honestly. And, uh, you know, they're not even perforated, so they do get a little hot. And so, you know, it's unfortunate because these are such good seats. So I'd honestly recommend probably going for a used one to get that functionality. Um, but then you miss out on all the great mechanical updates here for the S60. So it's unfortunate the way they package this. But one other thing I'm glad they have retained is this fantastic Bowers & Wilkins stereo. It's 15 speakers, 1,410 watts of power. Power. And I mean, if you know anything about these newer Volvos, everyone praises this system as one of the best in the industry. And I can echo that same sentiment. It is fantastic. It sounds so, so good. It's always blown me away. And uh, it's been a few years since I've tested the Harman Kardon to compare, admittedly. But this Bowers & Wilkins, it's $3,200, which is very expensive, even in this price segment. But if you are into music and you can splurge, go for it. It is fantastic. I love listening to all my music here in this thing, even though I'm just doing either Bluetooth audio streaming or the wired in CarPlay. It still sounds fantastic either way. But anyway, let's start up and go for a drive. The S60 still has the really nice Volvo key, which they did really well a few years back with the metal on the sides here and this leather like uh, vinyl here on the front and the back. It is really a nice key. One of my favorite keys still in the industry, honestly. Not too big or anything, just really well done. And of course, this key is access, key is entry and twist button. Sorry, you have this uh, little a twist thing you uh, you know turn in order to turn the car on and so you twist that here 
it turns right on. All right, so setting off here in the S60 recharge. So uh, the first thing you notice if you have a charge here is that it's you know totally silent here setting off. And uh, one thing is you know really impressive is the Volvo has done a really good job with the regen braking. So whether you're in the electric mode or you're using the gas engine, the brakes feel consistent and they feel the same, which is really great from a safety standpoint, which obviously is one of Volvo's big priorities. But it's just not an easy thing to do to blend it this well. And a lot of other companies don't do it as smoothly as Volvo does here. And so I really have to commend them for that. And it's of course just incredibly quiet, but I, I was actually kind of blown away. I don't remember the S60 being this quiet whenever I reviewed it back in 2019, but it is like insanely quiet, whether you are in the electric mode or even when you are with the gas engine running on. I mean, there's sometimes I haven't even noticed the gas engine running because it's just that quiet, especially when you're out on the highway. Throttle response is also great. Being electric, you know, here, it's just instant response. And even when you have the gas engine on, it's really responsive though, which is great. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting back to the ride. So you don't have the Polestar engineered version anymore that was previously offered. Um, they got rid of that here after the 2022 model year. So this is the sportiest way you can get an S60 now. And I think it's a really nice blend. You know, it still feels nice and sharp. I also am really appreciating the steering. It's uh, kind of nice where it's a little lighter than I'd say some of the com competitors might be, but uh, you know, it's not overly light and uh, still has some nice heft to it, especially whenever you're up at speed here. And I just am really appreciating uh, just how this thing drives. The first time I popped in this, this week, I was like, wow, like this is a lot better than I remember it being. And so I think they really made some nice changes here over the years, uh, along with the extra punch of the motors and all that. It's just also a really nice thing to drive. And as far as the electric range goes, you have 41 miles of electric range now, which is over double what you had previously, thanks to now having a 14.9 kilowatt hour battery. And I'll talk more about the electric mode in a minute here, but I'm gonna go ahead and put it up into the power mode, which immediately does kick on the gas engine. And uh, let's turn down onto this back road here and see how it does. Here we go. All right, so we're short shifting a little bit, but I mean, it still is plenty quick. It is really, really impressive, this thing. And so what we have to work with here is a two liter turbocharged four cylinder engine. They got rid of the supercharger, but it still does like 313 horsepower on its own. And then to add on top of that, you also have this electric motor, which is 143 horsepower on its own. And it's running exclusively to the rear wheels for that electric motor. And so the gas engine does the propulsion up front here. It is all wheel drive, but altogether we have 455 horsepower and 523 pound feet of torque. And it is really, a lot of power and the only competitor to this is the uh, BMW 330e and that doesn't even have 300 horsepower with everything working together so I mean this is far and away the fastest in this very narrow segment of vehicles we have to work with I mean this will blow the doors off a 330e all day long and it's really impressive and it'll do a 4.1 seconds there to 60 by the way so I mean that kind of illustrates just how fast this thing can be and I just love that electric motor is just right there always ready to go what I also love about about the electric motor is what especially whenever you're just in the EV mode is that it actually is a little uh, more rear biased than you might be expecting let's see if we can do it here yeah see it <laughs> It just kicked the back end out a little bit. Now, Volvo tunes their stability systems to be very conservative. So that's kind of part of the problem is there's really no way to turn that stuff off too much. Um, and so it just means that the nanny's gonna kick in before you can have too much fun with this, but it does give you a little bit and just enough to you know put a little grin on your face. But if you're someone who wants more and more extreme handling, you're gonna be disappointed in the fact this kind of kills some of the fun a little bit earlier than most other vehicles uh, this competes with. But um, it's I found it to be fun this week though. And the little bit of you know twitchiness I got out of the back end was a lot of fun, something you don't get with the previous S60s that were you know didn't have that much power going to the rear. But anyway, we're coming to some corners here and let's see how the S60 handles here. <laughs> so you get some squealing out of the tires and uh, you know it's it's trying its hardest. So I think part of the problem is the fact we're only running 235 wide tires, which is really narrow for a luxury sports sedan, in my opinion. I mean, this is, um, you know, obviously done to help increase the range. We also only have Pirelli P0 all-season tires, which uh, I'm personally not a huge fan of the Pirelli P0s. I don't think they have a ton of grip. I think if you did a better tire on this, you'd have a lot more competent handling than what you have here. You wouldn't have the squealing, and you might not have much of the rear end antics as well. So maybe it's a trade-off. Um, you know, maybe you don't want something too sticky because it does add a lot of fun there. But if you're looking for the maximum amount of grip, one tire upgrade should be, you know, a very easy way to make this a lot better. Because 
you know, it definitely feels like it's a little bit more on the understeery side. These are also heavy being the plug-in hybrid version here, and especially now the battery's gotten a lot bigger. So these weigh 4,457 pounds now. You know, I mean, that still is on par with what you get with stuff like this, but yes, it's heavy. We're talking 4,500 pounds for a luxury sports sedan, and most of the others in this segment are, you know, maybe 4,000 or so. Um, so, you know, it, but honestly, in my opinion, especially because of the way that they really lightened up the steering here, and I also have the steering, by the way, there's a mode here to make it heavier or lighter, and I have it on the heavier setting, but even still, it's just, it, they lightened it up a little bit so that it feels really eager to turn in still, and just the whole week, I actually found myself feeling like this was actually pretty sporty feeling for the handling, and I really appreciated it. I think it just, it feels like it wants to change direction really quickly and really well, and uh, just was fun. I just genuinely loved running errands in this thing, especially in electric mode, having that instant punch having a little bit of the tail happy antics there and it just was a lot of fun so I just really came away blown away with you know the handling is better than you might expect the electric punch and the, the power is better than you'd expect and as far as the electric punch goes now you can't go full throttle in the regular hybrid mode without it kicking on the gas engine they give you a little indicator there on the tack as far as how far you can go or the power meter I should say before it kicks on the gas engine and you can actually go a good bit of the ways down you don't have to be super precise it will kind of hold it and try and stay right at that threshold and then if you go a little bit further past them be like all right well now we'll kick on the gas engine but it's plenty of power by the way I mean I did for my highway drive I burned through that electric range and by the way I didn't do 100% electric driving so I can't say if I got exactly 41 miles of range but it seemed like it was pretty close to that if not even beyond that but um, you know whenever I was doing a lot of highway driving that 143 horsepower doesn't sound like much but uh, being electric horsepower means it's instant and I was able to do plenty of high speed highway passes, no problem, you know, you know, normal highway speeds here. And uh, it was just really impressive with the amount of power. You can merge onto the highway in it, you know, it's really, really good. And it's a far cry from the old T8 powertrain where that thing, I mean, if there was a slight breeze going against you and kick on the gas engine, or if you were stopped at a stop sign and there was any kind of incline whatsoever and be like all right gotta kick on the gas engine it was such a weak electric motor you only had i think less than 20 miles of electric range back then too so this is an enormous improvement and uh, because the battery has gotten so big by the way it's now eligible for the full 7500 dollar tax credit as well because these are actually built in south carolina so you have, they're, they're built in north america and you know that's a big enough battery and so that is a huge perk here as far as the value proposition for this um because you can get that tax credit which is awesome but another acceleration here and yep, I gotta slow it right back down. It's plenty of power to have fun in. I mean, you shouldn't have to say that. It's 523 pound-feet of torque, but it, you're not used to having this much power in a Volvo. You can tell there's still some enthusiasts there at Volvo that you know want this thing to have solid performance, and they didn't have to go as far as they did, but they went that far anyway, uh, despite not having any competition that's remotely this fast. Uh, and I just I love them for it. The fact that they you know made this thing as punchy as they did is awesome. And I also forgot to mention that this runs through an eight-speed automatic transmission whenever the gas engine is running, and it's really well programmed. So, I mean, I'm still in this power mode here, but I mean, it does a good job of, you know, giving me one downshift and going. It's really quick. It doesn't get confused or have to sit there and think about what it wants to do. The electric motor also helps to, you know, step in, give you some instant electric punch. And then it fills in basically that downshift waiting time. And then by the time the downshift, you know, happens, you know, then the gas engine spools up and you're going, but it all just works really well to give you a very responsive driving experience. And uh, man, that electric motor is a champ. It really, Again, I can't believe I'm, you know, glowing about 143 horsepower electric motor, but I mean, it really makes this thing feel like a rocket whenever you immediately tip in. It's really aggressive with the power ramp up and it just is really well tuned. <laughs> Man, merging onto the highway here. <laughs> yeah, this thing is really quick really really quick I won't say it anymore but uh, man man is it impressive but we're merging onto the highway here and so we'll turn on the pilot assist function which I did use a lot already this week on the 250 mile uh, little road trip that I did here and um, it actually works pretty well what I can say though is that it is very conservative and there was a few times where you know still a little slow with doing lane changes as far as you know accelerating like any adaptive cruise control system they're all very safely tuned so you have to really make sure there's a coast 
it's completely clear before it starts accelerating. It gets a little confused on some tighter corners and things like that. But overall, you know, it was a reliable system. I was able to trust it to do the lane keep very well for me. It's easy to turn on. It's easy to understand how it works. And just overall, um, I was really happy with the whole system. But one thing that I wasn't happy about safety tech wise this week was the backup camera. This is the first vehicle ever since backup cameras became mandatory federally and standard um, where it didn't work immediately. There's just a time yesterday where I hopped in the vehicle here and I you know, just quickly put it in reverse and was leaving my driveway and the backup camera just never came on. It's not like it had a little delay or anything, like it just never came on. And I mean, it seemed like the whole infotainment system was a little laggy, but most of them I believe have fail safe so that regardless of how dumb the computer is behind the scenes, the second it's in reverse, you get a backup camera no matter what. Um, and this did not do that. And for Volvo, again, being this safety obsessed company, for the Volvo to be the first vehicle I've ever had have the backup camera not work immediately or at all um, was really surprising. Maybe it's just a glitch with this one or something, uh, but I was just so surprised. And the funny thing was, I was like, okay, well maybe, you know, it'll uh, get better, you know, later on. And so I drove to my destination and then put it in reverse again, still leaving the car on, you know, put it in reverse again to try and, you know, back into a space. And then once again, it didn't work at all. So it just, it like didn't even try to come on. Um, so I'm not sure what the deal was there, but again, just a pretty big safety issue if your backup camera isn't working. I'm assuming that could be something a dealer could fix, but kind of strange that this press vehicle, um, you know, had it not work. It was just that one time it's worked every other time, but that's something that again, should work 100% of the time, no matter what, with no margin of error. So. Um, just one other little observation, but all the other safety tech work great. Otherwise, you know, if the blast ball monitoring, all that, you have great visibility, you know, if the S60, they did such a great job on this vehicle and that hasn't changed obviously in the past few years. You know, nice thin A-pillars, mirrors off onto the door, so easy to see forward there. Uh, you have a head-up display here um, and these higher trims to give you some extra information there. And, uh, you know, just really great otherwise from a safety standpoint. Of course, the big thing about Volvo is not just the tech, it's like many other companies focus on, but of course, the Volvo crash safety is fantastic. They always over-engineer their vehicles um, to exceed and you know pass not only just the current tests but their own internal stuff, which is even more strict and more demanding than all the uh, you know federal and insurance uh, testing that is out there. So that's one of the great things about Volvo's and one of the things they're famous for, of course. But I just want to highlight that you know the safety, if that's something that is a value to you, is still going to be top-notch here in the S60 and be another thing that puts this over you know some of those competitors. But the last couple of things I mentioned here are the efficiency and then the pricing and how it compares to its competition. So as far as the efficiency goes here, it's actually really impressive. And so what it's rated at here is 74 MPGE. So that is counting in you know, the electric help as well as the gas engine doing its thing. Um, and then if you're just using the gas engine alone, it's rated at 31 MPG combined. I believe it's 30 in the city and 33 on the highway. And so, I mean, that's still really solid efficiency even just for over 300 horsepower turbo four cylinder that's also lugging around 45 500 pounds basically I'm really blown away that they get that kind of efficiency out of this thing and then to do again 74 mpg is really really solid so um, as far as the trip computer here in the Volvo it's not it's kind of weird the way they have their trip computer set up um, so I can't say 100% exactly what it's referencing but over my 300 miles of driving here which is about 250 on the highway and then uh, you know about 50 or so around town uh, but it's been quoting me here a 45.1 mpg rating that's just regular mpg not mpge so that I mean makes me think that it's you know, not counting in the electric stuff, but it must be uh, because even though, again, most of that was on the highway, you know, I have a hard time believing I'm getting over 40 MPG even in purely highway driving. So I think that is, you know, again, using that electric assistance, which by the way, um, I did, I had basically a full charge whenever I set off for that highway road trip there. And then I did plug it in and get um, about two thirds of a charge here um, to give me a little bit more juice to, you know, film some more of the electric driving here for the review. So, you know, it wasn't two full charges, but I mean, you know, there was a lot of help there, but it just goes to show you how you can have it as a complete EV. Cause again, you have enough power and stuff. If you don't drive more than 41 miles a day, which I'd say is the average amount of Americans commute less than that. You can drive this completely as an electric vehicle and you have the pure electric mode. You can, you know, put it in, although that will restrict you to rear wheel drive. So if you need all weather capability, you know, you're going to have to use the gas engine. But aside from that, I mean, it's just so impressive. They've really kind of matured with these plug-in hybrids so that you now have real usable range, real usable power, no real compromises. You know, it's it, it can actually be a full-blown EV if you plug it in every night and you don't drive more than the, you know, quoted range. And so it's really, 
it's just so well done. I love all these new plug-in hybrids. No compromises, all the perks of an EV really, all the perks of you know a, a gas engine vehicle all at the same time. You know, it's really just fantastic. And um, I hope that Volvo keeps these plug-in hybrids around for a little while before switching over to the all-electric stuff here, you know, by the end of the decade or whatever, because I think these plug-in hybrids, this new generation here is so well done and it's gonna be a really great stepping stone for a lot of people that aren't ready to make the switch all the way up to an electric vehicle yet. Um, and I just, I really love it. And, you know, it's kind of surprising that Volvo is still basically the only player in this segment, aside from the BMW 330e, which is the only co competition here to mention, and this one, by the way, is $63,690. You start around $53,000. And this one, you know, is the Black Edition, has that expensive stereo and, you know, a few of the other things here, the climate package, which you still have to pay $750 for heated rear seats and a heated steering wheel, which seems a little unfortunate for a vehicle that's this expensive. But regardless, it doesn't even matter because that is still such a good price for a vehicle that is as fast as this is, basically a four seconds there at a 60. And the funny thing is a BMW 330e is going to cost you about the same amount of money anyway and it's way slower uh, you know less electric range and everything too it's just this is hands down the winner between the two of them in my mind I haven't driven the 330 but just on paper being so much slower I can't imagine ever picking the BMW over this and I mean yes compared to a non plug-in hybrid Volvo S60 it is about a $10,000 upcharge but like I said you get the $7,500 tax credit if you're eligible you know of course um, but you know so that really only makes it a $2,500 upcharge for all the extra power you get over a regular S60 all the electric range to me at that you know price point you're gonna save 2,500 bucks on gas uh, if you use this as a purely electric vehicle in a you know pretty short amount of time and uh, again this is the best of all the worlds and so you know especially these days with prices ballooning on everything to me having over 500 pound feet of torque a four second zero to 60 and having all the electric range and just all the luxury by the way you know for around sixty thousand dollars again before the tax credit when after the tax credit you're talking about you know if you go for a base one you're talking about something that's you know like forty five hundred or forty five thousand dollars that's this fast it's a volvo with a, a huge amount of electric range so i mean 45 grand is what you pay for a fully loaded prius prime basically and i mean again that'll that'll have uh you know uh, a few more features than this with the cooled seats and a few other things but i mean it's just kind of wild just how cheap these are to be totally honest and um volvo is usually not known for being the undercutter or the one that's you know the best value typically but in this case hands down it is and uh, i am just so impressed with the pricing of this the performance of this and everything about it as long as you can live with the compromises of you know a subpar infotainment system and a, not a lot of space here on the inside as far as you know storage space goes if you can live with those two things it's way, the way to go and honestly if i wanted a plug-in hybrid sedan I mean, I'm pretty sure this is what I would be going with, or even any luxury sedan in general. If you're looking in this segment, if you're looking at an M340i or something like that, uh, obviously this isn't going to sound as good or anything like that, but you have you know more punch and you have the electric ranges. I mean, it's just really a cool package. So anyway, I won't go on any longer here, but uh, as you can tell, I really love the S60. I think it's a great vehicle and uh, highly recommend it. But anyway, that's all of my thoughts on the S60 recharge. Let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below. Huge thanks to Volvo for providing me here with this vehicle to review for you guys today. By the way, thank you all very much for watching. Please also leave a like and subscribe to keep these videos coming. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.